Hello, and my name is Lowell Vanderpool, and this channel is dedicated to IT professionals, IT students, and anyone who's interested in technical subjects. Welcome back to our study of the OSI model. We are looking at the network stack, both theoretically and practically. We're looking at layer five. The theoretical concepts of layer five are tough. Some very, very bright people write the RFCs that write these protocols, and they're not easy to expose or to see how they work or their activity. It took a lot of work to find some tools that would allow us to look at them and see how, it, how they work. You're going to be surprised. You'll, you're going to recognize a lot of them. You just didn't plug them in at layer five. And don't get discouraged because you struggle understanding certain theoretical concepts. And the network stack is one of those. The people that write these protocols who, who are the people responsible for developing this kind of software are super bright people. Some of the brightest people on the planet. If you are struggling with understanding, don't give up. Just like this pup when he was small and trying to catch frisbees, he probably didn't get them very often. But over time and persevering and working at it, he catches those frisbees quite often. And don't think you're going to take that frisbee from him. We're looking at two conceptual models, the OSI reference model here on your left and the TCP internet model on your right. When we talk about developers that are developing software protocols or the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, as they create RFCs, they are all looking at the internet model and they take layer five, six, and seven, and they put it in one block called the application layer. Why even mess with OSI? Without a doubt, even though all of our developing and RFCs are built on the internet model, there's just nothing like the OSI helping us get a clear perspective sometimes, helping us to understand something that's difficult and allowing comparisons between what is in reality and looking at the OSI model and the fact that everybody still uses the OSI model. As we explore the layer five, the session layer, and we can see in this OSI model here, it's called the inter-host communication. That's its function. And we'll see why that's a pretty good definition. But look over in the data unit. Notice that it is dealing with application data streaming down from an application. And I'll get into that in just a minute. At the transport layer, we see we have segments. At the network layer, we have packets. At the layer two, we have frames and the physical layer bits. But I want you to pay attention that at application presentation and session layer, we're dealing with application data coming down into the network stack. Let's take, for example, I've got Corel Aftershock running on my PC. It's a desktop application, and it likes to talk to Corel's server farm way over here. And I don't know exactly where it is, but it's on the internet, and it's probably got a load balancer and then a server farm behind it. Now, Corel Aftershock sends hooks and information down the stack and basically gets to the session layer and says, look, here's the web address for Aftershock's I mean, Corel's server farm. And session layer hands that off to the transport layer and says, look, find out where this is on the internet. And this is a chunk of data that I need you to send to that server so that I can connect this application on my PC to a server-based application on the server farm. The transport layer, network layer, data link layer all do their job, get a DNS, work with DNS, get an IP address, and begin to send that request for a session between this application and this application to get that started. Once enough information goes back and forth, these two agree on a session. This application says, yes, we've got a session, and this server-based application 
says, yes, we're connected. Now, depending on the protocol that this application was written for, it could be using a number of different protocols at the session layer. It could be using RPC to communicate and talk to the server-based application. It could use Winsock. It could use H.3.3. So there's a number of protocols available depending on the programmer who wrote the client server application, how he uses session. But they're always going to be the same. This is going to be responsible for connecting this application through the session layer to this application. Now it's also going to do things like make sure that there's a recovery point. So if something nasty, so if I have something really go bad with my Central Florida Internet Exchange uh, data center or Tampa, let's say Spectrum sends me to Tampa to their internet exchange and I get a switch that is overloaded or I get a router that starts dumping my data between Aftershock and the server farm, the session will attempt to leverage a recovery point so that even if we've lost some data at, say, an exchange point, we can somehow recover and continue on with the session. Another important feature of the session layer is once we've got these connection and these are talking and data is moving, flowing appropriately. When I decide to close out my application on my PC, there has to be a way of gracefully shutting down this session. And so that is what those protocols at layer five are going to do. They're going to create the session. They're going to manage the session. They're going to have recovery points to the session and they're going to gracefully close the session. Now, before you get too excited about the recovery that I talked about, remember when I have an application streaming data down, the session layer and the transport, if we're using TCP, all have built-in mechanisms to try to fix missing pieces or out of, out of order pieces. And so there's a lot of recovery components in these layers, but they're never designed for catastrophic. So if I've got a stream of bits coming down and it hits the Central Florida Internet Exchange and in there is a switch that's just absolutely slammed and it starts dumping about a second of my data out, out into the bit bucket, that is probably about 300 packets and there's no way for this transport layer, even if I'm using TCP and this session layer and this session layer to try to recover. And that's where you get applications that lock up. You've, you're running Skype or Zoom and the other individual turns in this pixelated mess. Or if you're running a mobile app, the, the mobile app freezes and can't recover. And sometimes you have to reboot the phone. The network stack is designed to recover from a segment or a frame loss or small amounts, but not from these catastrophic failures. My favorite analogy for the session layer, the layer five, is the good old business meeting, the one that everyone loves. You first have an establishment of the session. You have a date and a time that everyone meets. You sit down and you orderly exchange data. There's conversations that go in and it's, it's following the agenda. You have rules to follow. And then at some point in that business meeting, you terminate the business meeting and hopefully you go to lunch. So let's look at the te technical definition. Provides services that allow the establishment of a session, manage a session, terminate a session connection, provides orderly data exchange, synchronizes the dialogue, and releases the connection in an orderly manner. An important feature of layer five is synchronization. My Corel Aftershot application on my desktop is talking to the Corel server farm. I'm depending on those lower level network protocol stacks to take care of getting the data there. But layer, layer five is synchronizing the data between my Corel Aftershot and my server farm application running on those servers. It's very important that we keep that data synchronized and that's a function of layer five. Let's look at these upper layers as they work together. So in my Skype application, you can see I've got my Skype. I've got Skype running on my desktop. It's going to send requests down to APIs in layer seven, the application layer. Those it's going to then begin streaming data and onto layer six presentation layer, which will take the data and convert it to binary. And it will most likely encrypt it because it's going to send it across the network. At layer five, we're going to establish the session between my Skype application on my desktop or laptop and the server farm that is managing all these conversations of everyone else, including myself. It's going to 
establish those connections. It's going to maintain the session between the server farm and Skype application on my desktop. And it's going to end the session appropriately when I decide to close out Skype or end the conversation. Let's lift the hood on Windows 10 and let's look at where layer 5 is. Most operating systems, including Windows, put most of layer 5 components and software modules in user mode. They're not in kernel mode. Popular protocols in layer 5 in Windows are Nets WinSox, NetBIOS, and RPC, Remote Procedure Call. There's more, but those are very popular. Let's look at this architectural diagram of Windows 10, and we'll get a better understanding of where the session layer is. Now, you can see I've got, in my case, I've got Hyper-V Hypervisor loaded, Hyper-V installed. I've got my secure, my VSM, my virtual secure mode. I've got my HAL, I've got my hardware drivers, and my kernel. And everything above that kernel is user mode. Now, all of those small blocks that are green and yellow are services. And if we look at our previous diagram, all of those session components are typically found in services running in user mode. So looking at services, here's one service that has got layer 5 in it. It's the Background Intelligence Transfer Service, BITS. Here's a few more. We've got RPC, Remote Procedure Call, which is a very popular layer 5 protocol session layer. Here's RPC Locator. Here's RPC Endpoint Mapper. We also have this server service, which provides SMB. And and we also have the workstation service, which provides SMB. So those are just a few. There's many more. So when you're asking yourself, where in Windows do I find layer 5? Open up your services. Let's look at common protocols in layer 5. The H245 protocol for multimedia, ISNS, the Apple Talk session protocol, NetBIOS, SMB or server message block, remote procedure call protocol, RPC, our real-time transport control protocol, short message peer-to-peer, -peer, the session control protocol, the SOX, which is used in Linux and Unix, and Microsoft ported that into the Win32 environment and changed the name to WinSOX, zone information protocol, and socket direct protocol. Let's take a look at the more commonly used layer 5 protocols. Just a quick refresher again. Let's take a look at some definitions. Notice it's session layer. It's in the software upper layers. It's to establish, manage, terminate sessions. It predominantly is APIs, sockets, and wind sockets. Keep in mind as we think about layer 5, layer 5 is data. So when you look at this chart and we look at session, presentation, application, it's data coming from those user mode applications that's streaming down into those top layer protocols in the network stack. Some protocols at layer 5 also include authentication, such as NFS or SMB. RPC can also include authentication as you transfer data from a server to a client software package. One very popular protocol at layer 5 is called Remote Procedure Call, RPC. Programmers love this because it makes it so much easier for the programmer. He can write a series of commands or instructions, and he can use the same instructions and commands that he uses locally on the local machine. He can use those same functions on a remote host. It removes the complexity of the network out of the picture. So RPC is a very popular layer 5 protocol. Win32 and Win64 desktop applications that are client server make a heavy use of RPC. In the Linux Unix world, NFS heavily leverages RPC. So here's a diagram of the Windows 10 network architecture that supports two very favorite layer 5 session layer protocols. One is RPC and WinSox. If they require authentication, they can reach out through services and talk to Active Directory to make sure that the user has the rights to these network remote hosts. GRPC is a high-performance RPC framework created by Google, and it runs on top of HTTP2. A number of languages use RPC, such as the Linux Unix NFS system, JSON RPC, SOAP, uses an XML RPC, Apache Thrift Protocol leverages RPC, and even HTTP. Back to those theoretical concepts of layer 5, we have dialogue control, and dialogue control allows communication between two processes. That communication could be 
half duplex or full duplex. Synchronization, again, is very important at layer five. It is part of the checkpoint and recovery system for layer five. Wind socks is another popular protocol at layer five. You can see the architectural block diagram for Windows 10. When when SOX runs over IP version 6, IP4, it also works over infrared data association or IRDA. It is also supported by Bluetooth. Windows uses the term WinSock. Linux and Unix use the term sockets. Both are very similar. Microsoft has modified the WinSock protocol to give extra functionality. You can look at your applications that use WinSock by doing the NetEsh WinSock show catalog. There's over 146 WinSock functions available to the programmer. Let's take a look at my Windows 10 box. I've got my PowerShell console up and I've typed in NetEsh WinSock show catalog. I'm gonna go ahead and enter. And you can see a lot of things came up. So we have like NTDS popped up, TCP IP. So these are all have some kind of hook into uh, Winsock, network, location, awareness, legacy, namespace. Here's Bluetooth. Here's PR, PNRP, namespace provider. So you can see there's a lot of stuff in here. Here's some email naming shim provider. So there's a lot of components that leverage Winsock. And you can just scroll through your catalog and you can see them. NetBias is a very popular layer five protocol. It was built around legacy applications and computer naming and work group naming systems. It was developed by IBM and Microsoft for DOS running on networks. Yes, long, long time ago. But due to thousands of critical government hospital business applications written in the late 1900s, early 2000s, if we tried to remove net bias naming, it would break these applications. So your computer name in many cases, especially computers not on domains, they're all limited to the net bias naming system. If you're on Active Directory, you have a fully qualified domain name, let's say like www.10.techsavvyproductions.com. That's a fully qualified domain name. But your computer name, VWP-10, is li limited to 15 characters because NetBias required a 15-character computer name. Have you ever tried to give your computer name a name longer than 15 characters? Well, you can't because of NetBias. Here I'm in the system applet. I'm in system properties, and I'm trying to change my computer name. And if you'll notice in the computer name dialog box, I put a long computer name. It doesn't like it because net bias rules in Windows 10. Due to that backward compatibility that Microsoft must maintain for these older applications, net, your computer name must meet the net bias standard, which is 15 characters. So even though I want to name my computer with a longer computer name, no go. 15 characters. Because of those applications I just talked about, many organizations, large organizations, government organizations, who are running these legacy applications have to en enable net bias running on their PCs. If you look at this dialog box, I go to network connections, ethernet properties, IP version 4, and then I go into advanced on my IP version 4 properties. I go into the winds tab and down below I can enable net bias over TCP IP. Now you don't normally need to do that at home, but some organizations have to have this feature in order for their legacy applications to function. So can we see this activity at layer 5? So let's take a look at some cool tools that lift the hood and let us see layer 5. Wireshark is a great tool to look at layer 5. So if you go to wireshark.org, you can download this tool. If you're not familiar with it, you probably don't want to use it until you've had a chance to learn it. But it's a wonderful tool to view and troubleshoot network traffic. So here I have my Windows 10 box and I've downloaded and installed Wireshark and I've went ahead and ran a capture. So I've already collected some network traffic in Wireshark. I'm gonna come up to statistics and go to protocol hierarchy and give it a chance to pull up all that information. Let's just go down to TCP because we know that's layer four and everything from that point on is gonna be layer five. So we see NetBias session service, we see SMB, we see RPC, we see server service. Remember that service I showed you earlier in the lecture. And we see malformed packet. And at this point we see hyper hypertext protocol. We know that that's probably layer seven. But everything between, sandwiched between TCP and hypertext is layer 
layer 5. Now let's scroll down to UDP. Here at UDP we see this is layer 4 so we see simple service discovery protocol, session transversal utilities for NAT, we set network time protocol, net bias, there it is, that's net bias name service, net bias datagram service, SMB, mail slots, and Microsoft Windows browser protocol. And then we get into multicast, but all of those are layer five. And you can see there's traffic, they're, they're running, they're working, that's layer five. Another delightful surprise was my favorite suite of tools, system internals. I ran auto runs and lo and behold I found some really jewels. So normally auto runs is a tool that I use to remove malware but I noticed in the tabs that Mark Rosinovich designed in auto runs they have a tab called WinSOC providers. Once the scanning finishes you do have to make some modifications under options you have to unhide Windows entries but when you do, you can go back to the WinSOC providers and there is a beautiful list of applications that leverage WinSOCs. These, by the way, are the same ones you saw in the WinSOC catalog. Here I'm actually using another Sys internal suite tools called TCP View. When you launch it, you can scroll up here to some of the system processes that are actually leveraging UDP and TCP and you can see they are part of the NetBIOS naming, NetBIOS datagram, and NetBIOS services. Here again we are exposing some of the NetBIOS components in Windows 10. Now when we're talking about voice over IP, video conferencing, internet telephony, and layer 5, one of the important protocols is H.323. It has a suite of tools to help create sessions, control, connect up circuits, tear down circuits, and manage circuits. So layer 5 is all about creating, maintaining, and ending sessions between endpoint applications. A hearty thank you for all the resources made available to people like myself so that I can do what I am doing on YouTube. Check out our channel and thanks for watching.